Uh, so we're pretty sure that they somehow lost their limbs and evolved from those creatures. Uh, we think that they went to more of a fossorial or underground lifestyle uh, because there was food available. They needed to burrow and search through those tunnels. So legs get in the way. If you're trying to get through a very, very small gap, arms and legs are going to get in the way. They make you wider. So if you lose them, you're able to slip into smaller cracks and crevices to get your food or to even get away from other predators. Um, we also show uh, studies that ancient snakes may have been surface dwelling nocturnal hunters who ate soft bodied prey in really watery areas. So that kind of leans more towards maybe they came from the water. But again, we aren't sure. It's still a complete mystery. Many of you might have heard of this. Uh, this is something that's super cool. And if uh, I just looked it up, it was already in 20, 2014 um, that this super cool uh, model of this giant snake from 60 million years ago called Titanoboa uh, was at Morrow Hall. Um, so we're pretty sure that this snake lived in South America. It was as long as a school bus and weighed about more than 20 people. Um, so quite a large snake. Uh, scientists found one of the vertebrae in a coal mine and they actually thought it was from a crocodile because it was so large. Uh, but then when they ran some tests on it, it was actually from a snake. Um, so one of the guys who is actually the curator of vertebrate paleontology at Morrill Hall, the State Museum for Nebraska, he was on the crew in Columbia that found this vertebrae. And uh, there's a really cool picture if you Google search his name, where he's holding up the vertebrae of an anaconda, which is maybe like this big, like a small little like cake pop size. And then this huge Titanoboa thing that's like the size of a softball. So there's a significant difference to how big the snake was compared to things that are alive now. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing. We know that snakes were very large. Um, so that's maybe where all these myths and legends come from. Um, but we know that they were extremely large um, back when it was warmer and our climate was very different. All right. So what exactly is a snake? Uh, snakes are reptiles. They belong to the order reptilia. Um, all of the things that include reptilia are turtles, tortoises, crocodilians, tuatars, lizards, um, and something that we call worm lizard. So it looks like the word amphibian, but it is actually a reptile. There's about 3,000 different reptiles, or sorry, different snakes on the planet. Uh, about 600 of them are venomous. And of those 600, 200 of those are, have a potent enough venom to uh, kill a person. So very, very small amount of those um, venomous snakes out there. Uh, their body's going to have scales. All snakes are going to have scales. Um, they usually shed their skin because those scales can become damaged. Uh, they do have backbone. A lot of people think that they are, they don't have backbones and they don't have bones because they are able to move in such a cool and serpentine way, uh, but they actually do have bones on them. Uh, their internal organs are a little different. They're usually linear or in kind of a line instead of side by side, like our lungs are side by side. Uh, their lungs actually one is super long and then they have one tiny little one that really doesn't even function. They have loose, flexible jaws. Their teeth are pointed and they curve backward. They don't have external ears. They don't have movable eyes and they don't have eyelids. They do have what we call ocular scales. Um, and so that is the eye that you do see. They just can not close them. All right, so scales. What are those scales made out of? Well, look at your hands, look at your fingernails. This is the same stuff. So it's called keratin. So all of your fingernails, your hair, your toenails, um, made out of the same stuff as what a snake's um, scale is made out of. If you've also ever seen a rattlesnake, their rattle is made out of the same stuff. The little bits and pieces that make it rattle, same stuff as your fingernails. Um, so if you guys have ever uh, broken your nail or clipped your nail, you know that they can become damaged. So uh, just like snakes, what they will do is they will actually um, shed their skin when they get too big, when something becomes damaged, if they are sick. There's lots of different reasons that they do that. Uh, so there's lots of different kinds of scales. There's smooth scales, bumpy, some of them overlap, some of them are really smooth. Um, there's lots of different colors and patterns on there. Uh, the color actually relies in their epidermis. Um, area. So what happens is when they shed their skin, they don't lose their color or pattern. It just kind of makes it brighter. Uh, scales also help keep that water in. So there's a huge difference between reptiles and amphibians. A lot of people kind of group those two things together. 
But uh, truth is they have not shared a common ancestor in about 300 million years. So they are like super far away. We are more related to frogs than a snake or a reptile is related to a frog. Monica, um, we had yeah. a, a question in the chat. Um, just wanting to clarify, are the scales the skin or are the scales on the skin? Like um, kind of a little clarification on that. Yeah, so when you look at a snake, um, so they do have skin. They have different layers, just like we do. The scales sit at the very top. So those get shed all the time. And that actual skin layer is below them. Um, some of them will have uh, overlapping scales that you can kind of like not pick back, but you can look back and see the skin. Uh, some of them, you will see the skin in between them, um, but their actual skin never sheds. Their scales on top will be the ones that shed. Awesome, thank Good you. Good question. All right, so um, have you guys ever seen fish? You can actually take their scales off and it doesn't damage their body. Um, but if you take a scale off of a uh, snake while they're not shedding, it can actually really hurt them. So even though those two animals have scales, they're very different from each other. All right, so shedding, all snakes will shed their skin. It kind of depends on the environment, how much they eat, um, what temperature is, is outside. That all depends on why they shed their skin. Uh, the inner layer of skin will also produce this kind of oily fluid that helps detach that layer um, from the top. So if you guys notice this picture here, that light colored kind of um, not styrofoam, but bubble wrap kind of thing that's coming off. That is their uh, scales shedding and all that stuff underneath is the new stuff. Um, so they shed in one huge piece. And usually what happens, you can kind of tell the snake is getting ready to shed. They won't be as bright. Um, they'll kind of become like cloudy and maybe like a milky blue color. Uh, they will shed their ocular scales. So that will also become kind of a milky blue color. So they can't see during this time. So they usually kind of lay low and hang out until they shed and then they get that, that vision back. All right, um, so much of a snake's body is gonna be muscle. They do have organs just like we do, but they are shaped like sausages instead of next to each other. The paired organs like kidneys, um, instead of being side by side, they're one on top of each other. It just makes more sense for how their body is laid out. Uh, so except for the skull, basically they have ribs and they have vertebrae. Um, very, very few snakes, uh, only pythons and boas. They retain what's called the vestigial legs. Uh, so if you ever see a very long boa or a python, if you look back towards their tail, you can actually see two little spurs, um, which are the remnants of their legs. They're very primitive animals. Um, so you can actually still see those little tiny legs that they still retain. So very neat. Uh, snakes also have something called a glottis. If you've ever seen like the anaconda movies, there's this like big tube that comes down. That is so that when the snake eats, they can still breathe. Um, so even though that stuff is in their mouth, they're still getting air and oxygen into their body. Uh, their heart will actually shift around in their body. It will still beat. It's still connected to everything. Um, but when they eat, it kind of shifts around to make room for that food. All right, snakes, um, they have really good senses. They can feel their way in the dark. They use their scales. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, know that they use their tongue to smell. They don't have eyelids, so they can't blink, and they're very good at close range vision. They can't see very far away. Um, some of the nocturnal snakes will have different colored and different um, shaped pupils, um, depending on if they're nighttime hunters or if they're daytime hunters. Um, so that typical snake, you will see their tongue flicking in and out all the time. Um, what they're doing is they're tasting the air. Um, so they take in all these chemicals and they transfer them into something called the Jacobson's organ, which is inside of their mouth. And they basically use that for taste and smell. Um, so every time they're sticking their tongue in and out, that's how they're smelling the air. They can't really hear. Um, they don't have external ears like we do, um, but their jaw bones actually can sense that vibration. So even if you quietly footstep close to them, they can still feel that vibration. Um, that's a lot of the times how they know a predator is around um, because again, they don't have that best vision at, um, unless they're at close range. Uh, pit vipers, like this rattlesnake that I have here, will have something called pits underneath their eyes um, that can detect that infrared heat. So if you've ever seen um, 
for instance, like an animal in the dark, they light up if they're warm blooded, or you can see where the warmest part of their body is. Snakes can see that um, if they have those pits on them. So uh, pit vipers like rattlesnakes will have them, but also things like boas and pythons can have it a little bit as well. They have those pits around their eyes too. All right. How do snakes move? Um, a lot of people think they just slither, and they do, um, but there's different ways that they do this. Um, so without arms and legs, it kind of seems like they have this huge handicap for them, um, but they don't. They can still burrow, they can swim, they can climb, they can slither, they can do everything that we can do, but they just don't have arms and legs. Um, so they can still burrow, uh, they can swim, all snakes can swim. Some snakes don't like to swim, but they can. Um, and then they can climb. If you've ever watched a snake climb a tree, it's fascinating to watch. They use their scales and they push against the tree branches or the bark and they basically just pull themselves up. So again, we talked about how snakes are a lot of muscle. They need that muscle. Um, so if you've ever heard of like six pack abs, like snakes have like 52 pack abs because they're so strong. All right, so there's four different ways that snakes will move. Um, one of them is called the rectilinear movement. Uh, sometimes people call it the caterpillar movement. Um, so if you've ever seen a caterpillar, they push part of their body, they lift this part up, they push this part down. Um, it's kind of how a caterpillar moves. Part of their body actually comes up off the ground. Uh, this is for really large snakes, uh, like boas, pythons, something that has a lot of weight to them. Uh, there's something called a concertina movement. Uh, what I always used to think of is like an accordion, how you go up and down and kind of goes like this. Um, their body kind of folds in half and then they pull this body part forward and then push their back. So um, you can see in the picture here, it's really kind of hard to explain, but the picture does a really good job. Uh, the serpentine is a lot of snakes, almost, I think it was like 60, 70% of snakes will move in this way. Basically, they just make an S, they kind of glide across the ground and then side winding snakes. This is the ones like you see in the desert. Um, if they had a lot of weight and they put the, their weight on the sand, they would kind of sink through the sand. So they simply just glide across it um, like a sidewinder would. All right, where do you find snakes? They can be found every continent, every single place except Antarctica, Iceland, Ireland, Greenland, and New Zealand. Um, they can also be found in a variety of habitats, rainforests, temperate forests, deserts, grasslands, savannas. Um, there's lots of different types of places where you can find snakes. Um, some of them have a great biodiversity or diversity of snakes. For instance, tropical forests, um, every single snake family except for two can be found in a tropical forest. Um, mountains, they're gonna be a little bit more specialized. You're gonna find a lot of vipers in mountain areas just because of that high elevation. And you're even gonna find them in places like urban settings. So in Lincoln, we have a lot of garter snakes. We have a lot of line snakes. We have a lot of racers. Um, so they don't really mind that disturbed habitat. There's a lot of rodents and a lot of food for them. So um, it's a great habitat for them. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about snake feeding and um, First of all, is there any questions or anything in the chat? Oh, we've got a couple. One of them, um, what's the oldest age for a snake? The oldest age? I have no idea. That's a really good question. Yeah, and I, I asked for uh, additional information if we were thinking like Nebraska species or if we were thinking like in general. Um, so we, we, were, we were, that was one of the questions. Um, and then the other question was, um, do you know of some maybe diseases or, or things that make um, the snakes twist in knots? There is one. Um, I can't think of what it is off the top of my head. Um, it is something, gosh, I can't remember what it's called, but there is something very weird that makes snakes do that. It's almost like a, I don't know if it's a parasite or something, but it makes them twist, yeah, twist their body in knots. Um, I, I would have to look that up, but yes, there's something very similar to that. I can't remember what it's called or could really tell you any more information, but I do remember hearing about it before. So um, yes, that's a good question. Um, and one that we just got in is wondering why some snakes are not found in areas like Ireland or Greenland or New Zealand? 
Uh, so New Zealand was kind of a, a shocker for me. I would think that that would be a great place to find snakes. Uh, so I'm not really sure on that one, but places like Ireland, Greenland, Iceland, um, it's all about that ectotherm. So they need the same, whatever they, the temperature is around them is what their body temperature is going to be. And those places, they just can't quite um, survive in those areas. They get too cold. Um, they're just not really suited for um, what we call ectotherms or cold-blooded animals. All right, well, um, those are most of the questions anyway. I've got a few more, but maybe we'll save them for a little bit further um, uh, in the presentation. Okay, cool. All right, here we go with snake feeding. All right, so types of food that snakes eat, uh, they're basically gonna be divided into two main categories. We call them specialists or generalists. So specialists are certain types of snakes that only eat certain types of food. Um, there's not ton of these kinds of snakes, but they are out there. And then generalists just basically eat whatever they can find within reason. Um, so they could eat things like invertebrates. Uh, there's quite a few snakes that eat invertebrates, especially smaller ones. Um, fish, these are a lot of like semi-aquatic, aquatic species. Uh, amphibians, same thing. Uh, we do have one in Nebraska, a couple in Nebraska, the hog noses, um, especially the eastern hog nose, they are a specialist. They feed primarily on frogs and toads, and they really won't eat anything else. That's why a lot of times people try to keep them in captivity and they just can't because they don't have that fresh supply of frogs and toads. Um, a lot of them will also eat other reptiles. Um, lots of them eat lizards. A lot of snakes will eat other snakes. Uh, king snakes are known to do this. They eat um, lots of different types of reptiles, especially other snakes. Uh, birds, a lot of our snakes eat birds. Um, it's not just our arboreal or our tree living species either. A lot of them can eat ground dwelling birds or ground nesting birds. Uh, for example, our bull snakes here in Nebraska, they will sometimes eat ground nesting birds and eggs because that is what they're finding on the ground. Uh, mammals are gonna mostly be reserved for larger snakes. If you think about it, if you're a ring neck snake who's like 12 inches long, you probably won't eat a mouse because the mouse could eat you. Um, so that risk of injury is just too much for those animals to eat them. Uh, but when they do eat mammals, it's mostly rodents, um, unless you get to the larger snakes where there's some that can eat antelope, there's some that can eat white-tailed deer, um, for instance, not in Nebraska, um, but in the world. Um, a lot of them also can have a shift in prey. Um, for example, a lot of younger snakes, when they're little, uh, they just can't eat mammals yet. They're too small. So they eat a lot of lizards. And then when they get a little older and bigger, they'll change their diet to mammals. So um, there's quite a few snakes that will change depending on their size. All right. So how does a snake eat? Um, a lot of... Um, I know people will argue with me, but there's two different kinds of snakes. There's constrictors, and then there are venomous snakes, um, ones that envenomate their prey. Um, so a lot of the times the constrictors, what they will do, um, like the, for instance, our boas, our pythons, our anacondas, our bull snakes, um, things like that in Nebraska, we have a lot of them um, who what they will do is they will flicker their tongues, they'll find their prey, and they follow that scent, um, and then they will strike. So they're very accurate when they strike. We talked about how they have really good close range vision. So a lot of the times they will get as close as they can to that prey before they strike. Um, and then every time what they will do is they will coil up, they'll grab their food. And then every time that prey breathes out, the snake will tighten and tighten and tighten until that lack of oxygen basically makes the animal pass out. Um, there are some Snakes that eat frogs and amphibians um, who eat them live, uh, not a lot of them. I think they lived in South America, but uh, we just don't have those in Nebraska. So once the constrictor stops eating, uh, what it will do is it will swallow, it will find the head um, and swallow it whole. So the head, the reason that they go for the head first is because they are less likely to get injured with claws, with horns, um, whatever they're eating. Um, and it's an easier way to just kind of move that animal down their, um, their esophagus. So their digestive system is also very strong. Their juices in there, uh, they can break down skin, bone, muscle, um, antlers at times too, feathers, um, other scales. They can pretty much break down anything. Uh, snakes that eat larger snakes that eat larger meals. This could sometimes last them for months or even a year um, if they eat a very large meal. They don't expend a ton of energy, uh, so this can last them a while. All right, so I get a lot of questions all the time about how snakes eat 
something. Um, so a lot of the times you might see, for instance, like a, a snake eating a bird. How do they eat something that is this big when their mouth is this big? Um, I hear a lot of times people say they detach their jaw or they uh, break their jaw. Nope, not true. Um, those things sound very painful. Um, if you ever um, detach your like shoulder blade or something or you break a bone, that's very painful. And so snakes couldn't do that every single time they wanted to eat. Uh, so basically, if you guys want to go ahead and touch your jaw, you will notice on yourself that your jawbone is one solid bone right here. So snakes, they don't really have a chin. So right here, they have an empty space, their bones stop. So they are able to move their uh, jaw bones out to the sides. And then they have really stretchy ligaments right here that help their bodies and their mouths move up and down. So really wide and really tall. So they're able to work their mouth around their food. Um, a lot of the times you will notice, if you can kind of see it on this picture, those snakes have that little tube that runs from their mouth. That's an extension of that trachea um, so that they can breathe while they're swallowing their food. So they don't detach, they don't break their jaws, they just simply have expandable mouths. All right, so snakes have different types of teeth. Uh, we're going to really quickly go through these, um, but these guys, one of them that we have here in Nebraska, um, the hog noses. So they're actually called rear fang snakes. Um, so these guys, what they basically have to do is move the food all the way down pretty much past their throat and to be able to use their fang. So um, you can even go home tonight and say that um, a Western hog nose in Nebraska has a very, very mild venom. It's not used for people. It's mostly for the frogs and toads that they eat so they can immobilize them and eat them. Um, but there are other animals in this family, uh, things like boom slangs, which are very deadly. Um, and they produce those what we call hematoxins. So they do have fangs and they do produce a certain toxin in there. All right, we also have something called um, proteroglyphs. So these guys are going to be like your Elapidae family. This is a very large family, but it includes things like cobras, sea snakes. Um, their venom is what we call a neurotoxin, which affects the nervous system. Um, so they have to apply a lot of pressure to bite into their food. Um, a lot of people think that cobras have the really, really long fangs. They don't, they're very small actually, um, but spitting cobras are also in this family and they have their front fangs that they will actually use pressure to spit um, their venom out. So they actually do do that. And then we also have something called a selenoglyph, um, which is a lot of our vipers. This is like our prairie rattlesnake that we have in Nebraska. So these are the ones that you always see that have the super long fangs. Um, so when their mouth is not open, they fold back into their mouth. And then once they open their mouth, they come back out. They're like on a sliding door. Um, this allows them to penetrate their fangs um, very deeply into their prey. Um, they're usually less powerful venom though. So they, they basically sacrifice the potency of their venom for the size of their fangs. All right. Real quick. I know we're moving quick, but do we have any questions or anything? These will always be available to view afterwards as well. So. Yeah, so we're, we're, you're talking about, we have some questions about the spitting of venom and why would a snake want to spit venom as opposed to inject it? So for instance, like our spitting cobras, uh, we don't obviously have them in Nebraska here, um, but they usually do that to blind their prey um, or to uh, hurt the eyes of the prey if they can't get close enough to bite. Uh, so again, cobras don't have very long teeth uh, or fangs. So what they will do is they sometimes immobilize their prey with the spit. Um, they usually aim for the eyes or the face. And then what will happen is they slither over to it and then they try and eat it. Um, Very cool. That's, that's um, most of, of them um, for, for right now. Anyway, we've had some other interesting questions that we'll get to later, I think. I see someone put like a um, scaleless snakes are cool. Um, yes, there are certain people um, within the pet breeding industry that have actually bred out scales in a lot of snakes. Uh, 
these would never survive in the wild. Um, the one thing bad about these guys too is if you ever have them in captivity, they are easily burned, they easily get cold, they just simply don't have those scales to protect themselves. So they may look kind of cool, um, but they're something that has definitely been um, hybridized in that pet breeding industry too. So. All right, we'll go ahead and work on. So I get a lot of questions about venomous snakes in Nebraska. One more, sorry yeah, to go back. Yeah, what's up? We had we had a question about uh, a cobra and what type of cobra was in um, one of the pictures that you had. Uh, was Remember? it? It has to be that one. Um, I think this is oh gosh, a monocled cobra. You can't see it, but there's like an eye and on the back, like a monocle eye on the back. Um, I think that's what it, this one is. Okay, cool. Yeah, we have a, a friend that's six years old that wanted to know. So thanks for answering that. Yes, good question. All right. All right, so I get a lot of questions about venomous snakes in Nebraska. So I did want to talk a little bit about what venom is, what snakes have venom, what does it do, what do you do if you get bit by a venomous snake. Um, so I want to talk a little bit first about what these things mean. So when we say toxin, toxin is any substance derived from an organism that has effects on another organism. So for instance, a venomous snake is an organism and if it would bite its prey, it has that venom has an effect on that other animal. Um, we, a lot of people use ex interchangeably uh, venom and poison. They're very different. Um, there are one, there is one poisonous snake, um, but it is not in Nebraska, obviously. Um, so all of the snakes that we have in Nebraska are what we use venomous. Um, so difference between venom and poison is that venom has to enter your body through a bite or a sting. Poison can either be, um, you can touch and then like touch your mouth um, or you can breathe it or inhale it in so, um, or eat it. So very, very different things. Uh, there's not a lot of people out there. For instance, this is a copperhead. This picture I have here is a copperhead that we have in Nebraska. Um, you don't eat the animal, you don't touch it and then touch your mouth. You can touch this animal just fine and not be hurt as long as they don't bite you, obviously. Um, but, and again, I am not going to go up smell the snake and inhale their venom or anything. So they're two very, very, very different things. Uh, to make things even more confusing, all venoms are poisons, but not all poisons are venoms. All right, there are different types of toxins. So within venomous snakes, they deliver a different type of toxin depending on the species. So there's cytotoxins, there's hematoxins, there's neurotoxins, and then those cardiotoxins. It just depends on what they affect. Uh, for instance, neurotoxins are gonna affect your nervous system. Um, we can't all classify one species into one type of toxin. Um, they're just too broad um, and it's often wrong. So venoms are very complex and they often can be neurotoxins and cytotoxins or they could be hematoxins and cytotoxins. So we can't always just say this animal produces this one thing. Um, most venoms though are neurotoxic or hematoxic. That's a majority of the species that we have in the world. All right, so the venom gland, when we look at a snake, um, venom evolved over time. Um, so it was devolved from something called the duberoid gland um, in non-venomous snakes, which is just their salivary glands. Um, the compressor glandule um, is a muscle that puts pressure on that gland to release that venom. So venom will actually travel through a series of ducts in the mouth, um, through the bones, and into the hollow fang. So fangs are hollow. They're not solid bone or anything. Um, and they function very similar to a hypodermic needle. So a very long um, pointy needle. All right, so how do snakes deliver this venom? They start from a coiled position. They open their mouth and show their fangs. They tilt their head back. So those fangs are at the front when they strike. They will strike forward to get that maximum depth and venom delivery. Why do snakes have venom and why do some not? Um, mostly it's to immobilize prey. Um, so there's different venoms um, for different types of prey. Um, some of them are affected by some, some are not affected by some. Uh, there's different strike strategies. For instance, there's strike and release. Um, a lot of our rattlesnakes will do this. They're, they're kind of wimps. They will bite and then they like, oh my gosh, please don't hurt me. Um, but there's some that will bite and hold on uh, to their prey. Uh, purpose of venom digestion. It really evolved to help digest their prey. So it's a special um, 
cocktail, what we call it, it's a special blend of digestive enzymes. So snakes that eat really large food items, um, they're reduced mobility. They don't move a lot if they've eaten a huge meal. They're very vulnerable to predation, especially after they eat because they can't move very fast. Um, so over time evolved venom um, to help them protect themselves and to also digest as well. Venom is very expensive in the animal kingdom. We talk about um, being really expensive to produce or manufacture. Uh, it's not going to be wasted on non-prey. Um, so evasion is always going to be the very first tactic of defense. So if I come up to a snake, the first thing that they want to do is run away um, or slither away. Sorry, um, slither away. Uh, if they can't do that or they feel like they're backed into a corner or they can't, there's no escape route, that's when they're going to start hissing. They're going to false strike. They're going to rattle their tail. Something to let you know, hey, I am scared. I do not like this. Get away from me. The very, very last thing they're going to do is strike with that in venom um, injection. So again, that's their very, very last line of defense. All right, so I also hear a lot of myths when I talk about snake bites. Um, most venomous snakes inflict, inflict a dry bite on humans because they know they are too large to be prey items. Uh, this is false. In fact, studies have shown that rattlesnakes have a higher yield during defensive strikes than they do during predatory strikes. Not all snakes, but just rattlesnakes in general. All right, true or false, I've heard of this one a lot too. Baby snakes are more dangerous than adults because they basically don't know how to use their venom. Um, this is false. And many times baby snakes have different dietary preferences. Um, so they have a different type of venom cocktail or blend um, than the adults do. Uh, sometimes they're more lethal than the adults, but sometimes the adults are more lethal than the babies. It just depends on what they're eating. All right, true or false, anti-venom is made from venom and contains venom in it. So if you've ever had someone or uh, heard of someone getting bit by a venomous snake, obviously you have to give them something to help that. Um, so what we give them is called anti-venom. We'll talk about this here in a second. Um, but basically what that is, is it's venom. That's false. There is no venom in anti-venom. It is only the blood serum product um, that occurs in that. All right, so when we talk about snake bites in the world, how many are there? Um, there is about 421,000 envenomings um, with about 20,000 deaths globally every year, um, possibly higher than that. Um, a lot of those places like Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't know the records. Um, there's not a lot of people um, that have close um, ties to doctors in that area, so they don't go report that they were bitten by a venomous snake. So it's probably a lot higher than we think it is and a lot more deaths just because we don't know about them. Uh, most governments do not even mandate reporting snake bite data. Um, here in the United States, it's very different than other places of the world. Uh, most snake bites though are gonna be in Asia, Africa, and then Latin America. All right, how about nationally? What do we see in our country? There's only about 7,000 reported annually, about 97 deaths in the past 20 years. That's about five a year. Um, the death rate is 0.0007%. Um, that assumes about 7,000 snake bites over 20 years. Um, so it's very low compared to the rest of the world. Uh, when we talk about fatalities, dog bites, there's 10 to 20 a year, bee stings, that's 30 to 120, even lightning strikes, there's 75 to 300. So still very much higher than our um, snake bites here in the United States. All right, who gets bit? Well, boys, sorry, there's a nine to one ratio males, um, more likely between the age of 18 to 28 years old. Um, the mean age is going to be about 29.5, but all about 50% of all snake bites are going to be males in between 18 to 28 years old, and they're going to be white. That's just what the statistics say. Um, a lot of the times they're trying to handle the pets. They're trying to take a photo. Um, they're trying to grab the snake behind the um, on the neck, which is not the right way to do it, um, to try to take a picture. There's lots of dumb reasons why they do this. Um, bite locations, about 95% of all bites are going to occur at your extremities. So your hands, your arms, your legs, your feet. Um, it's just the easiest spot for that snake to bite. All right, so what is antivenom? So uh, sometimes people call it antivenin, antivenin. Um, so antivenom is what we use in the United States. If you are bit by a venomous snake, 
besides a coral snake, this is what you're going to use. It's called CroFab, uh, which is, this is what it means, that crotalid polyvalent immune fab. Um, so that polyvalent is going to be used for lots of different types of species. Um, it's made from venom from four different types, the Western Diamondback, the Eastern Diamondback, Mojave, and the Cottonmouth. So what we do to test this, uh, sheep are actually injected with very, very small amounts of venom. And then this provokes that immune response. It's very similar to when you guys get a, like a chicken pox shot. Um, so when you get a chicken pox shot or some type of vaccine, what happens is your body starts building those immunity um, antibodies to it. And then that invokes that immune response. So we take those antibodies from sheep and then we purify them. And then we use that in anti-venom. So there is no venom in anti-venom. All right. I also get a lot of questions from kids and people. Um, what's the most dangerous snake? What's the most uh, largest snake? What is the most venomous snake? So to answer these, they're all good questions, but they all have different answers. Uh, so a lot of the times I hear, what is the most venomous species? I'd probably say it's the inland taipand in Australia. So you only need about 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. So depending on how much you weigh, um, you only need 0.1 milligrams, 0.01 milligrams um, for it to, um, to, to harm you. So it's very, very lethal when we talk about it. Um, however, they are extremely docile. Um, bites are rare, but still it does happen. Um, if you are bitten by this venomous snake, you get about 30 minutes to live. Um, so unless you, again, get that anti-venom. All right, what is the deadliest snake? I hear this a lot. Um, I'd probably say it's the Russell's Viper um, in Asia. So this snake is responsible for one third of all snake bites. That's pretty high. Um, so bites from this snake are the fifth leading cause of death in Myanmar. Uh, so when we think about that, that's the fifth largest uh, death in the United States it is a car accident. Uh, so snake bite versus car accident, it's just very different types of things that people have to worry about. Uh, these snakes are also responsible for more deaths globally than any other species. All right, what species is the most dangerous? I hear this question a lot too. Um, I'd probably go with black mamba. They're very large, they can get up to 14 feet long. They have a very large distribution, uh, mostly in Southeast Africa. They are pretty aggressive. I'm not kidding you, they will chase you down. Um, when, when I went to Africa, we got to see them, unfortunately not in the wild, but we saw them and they are huge snakes. Um, so they get their name Black Mamba, not because of the color of their scales or the color of their body, but when they open their mouth, it is pure black inside. So that's where they get their name. They also have an extremely potent or lethal venom. Um, you need about 0.25 milligrams per how much you weigh. And these guys are also deadly because they can climb up the walls and into your houses. All right, so what do we have here in Nebraska? We have four different kinds of venomous snakes in Nebraska out of our 29 species that we have. Uh, three of these species are found in extreme southeast Nebraska. So your copperheads, your timber rattlesnakes, and your massasauga are going to be found very, very southeast Nebraska. Prairie rattlesnake is a little bit larger of a distribution. They're going to be kind of in western Nebraska. Um, maybe Amanda can talk a little bit about if she's ever seen any out there. Um, but they, that one's going to be a little bit farther west than here in the eastern part of Nebraska. All right. That's all I have today. Um, again, I could talk forever about snakes. There's so much stuff that we didn't talk about today or cover. Um, so we might be doing a, a Science of Snakes 2 coming maybe next year. Um, but our next Science of Series is going to be next Thursday, and it's going to be our last one for the year. Um, we're going to be talking about Nebraska fish. Uh, so my friend uh, and co-worker Grace Gard is going to be joining us. She is the Aquatic Education Specialist for Nebraska Game and Parks. And also we're going to have Daryl Bauer joining us next week to answer some questions as well. So a lot of knowledge coming next week, a lot of from the experts as well. All right, so that's it. Usually I say, okay, uh, two weeks from now, or here's the schedule. Um, next week is the last one. We'll probably do another series starting in 2021. And then that's all that I have. We'll obviously open it up for questions next, um, but please join me next week, same time, Thursday, 3 p.m. Uh, for Nebraska fish. And this is gonna be about fish that um, are not game fish. So maybe some fish you didn't even know we had in Nebraska. 
All right, so I'll go ahead we, and open it up yeah, for questions. Yeah, we had a, a good question, wanting to know a little bit more about how snakes lay eggs. Yeah, that is one thing I did not talk about today. Um, I kind of missed the whole reproduction thing. That was a long, interesting topic. So um, there's three different types that we have um, of snakes. So there's ones that actually don't even lay eggs. So garter snakes, for example, they give live birth. They do not lay eggs at all. Um, some snakes will lay eggs, uh, like for instance, our bull snakes, they lay eggs, um, very similar to, very similar to birds. They're going to be not a hard shell. They're going to be a little bit more leathery and like a ping pong ball when you touch them. And then there are some snakes that have eggs inside them and then they hatch and they come out alive. So there's very different ways that they, um, they reproduce. That's kind of the short end of it here. But again, I would love to cover that topic maybe next year when we do another science of snakes. Um, we have had several questions about um, snakes and if they're able to get COVID. I, you know, I don't know if we even know enough about the disease to say whether snakes can get it or not. So um, I'm not sure. And then the, along that line, they were asking about the anti-venom and, and seeing if that was the same way that they were making the COVID vaccine. And I don't know if you can attest to that or not. But I have no idea. I, I, I have really no idea. This was all about snakes and, and not about COVID. So I don't know. Um, what's the most common snake in Nebraska? <sighs> most common snake in Nebraska? I'd probably say like a garter snake or a bull snake. Um, bull snakes are found pretty much all over the state. They have a huge range in Nebraska, um, but also things like garter snakes. I mean, there's tons of garter snakes out there too. So probably between one of those two. Uh, another question we had, we wanted to know if snakes are smart. You know what? I really like snakes. I think they're so cool, but they're not the smartest animals out there. <laughs> they're not the brightest. Um, they're, they're just, they have a very, very small brain compared to the rest of um, the animal kingdom. So good question. We've had some questions on the smallest snake in the world. Um, we talked about it being a thread snake, right? Is that okay. right? Um, and in Nebraska, is it the ringneck snake the smallest? Yeah, there's a couple that are really similar in size. There's, um, for instance, like the, there's a red belly snake. There's a Western worm snake. We have the ring neck snake. They all get the de decays brown snake or just a brown snake, I guess it's called. They all get to be about 12 inches long. So about the size of a ruler. Um, that's about, yeah, those three are probably tied with each other. Okay, because they, I, I read a little bit about this. It's in Barbados. There's a thread snake and it's like um, a spaghetti size. Oh, okay. I found was very it, uh, worldwide. But uh, I mean, um, the other question we had was what's a, what's a, what's a snake's like range? How far will they go from their home? Good question. Uh, some snakes can travel a really long distance away, um, but mostly what they're going to do is when they come out of hibernation, again, another topic we didn't even talk about, but when they come out of hibernation, the first thing they want to do is go find a mate. Uh, so they will travel a really far distance sometimes, um, but a lot of the time snakes will come back to the same area that they um, they have their hibernation area in or their hibernaculum in. Not all snakes will do that, um, but some of them will. So they could travel 50, 60, 75 miles sometimes. And if you think about it for a snake, that's quite a distance, so. Right. Um, we we're also were wondering about ring neck snakes, you know, cause their tail has that little bit of red and uh -huh. wanting to know whether they are venomous cause you know, red in, in nature is kind of usually danger symbols. Yeah. So they're really similar to like a monarch butterfly. A lot of scientists think that they just taste really bad. Uh, so when they see a predator, they will roll over and show that warning red color. And a lot of times scientists think that they're trying to say, hey, just letting you know, don't eat me, I taste really bad. So it protects them um, because otherwise, yeah, they don't really have any defenses. They're very tiny and they're not venomous or anything like that, so. Okay, and one more, we got lots of stuff coming in, but. They want to know the largest snake in Nebraska. Now, I don't know if that means by length or by weight. 
but uh, the largest snake yeah you um probably bull snakes bull snakes are pretty large but then we have a really second close contender with the western black rat snake um so bull snakes are pretty much found everywhere uh they get pretty large sometimes up to eight nine feet um are Black rat snakes can get very similar in size, uh, six, seven, eight feet. So um, probably like a good between those two. Awesome. Yeah, we, like I said, we've had a lot of questions. Um, one person was um, curious to know how a snake um, burrows so fast. They had garter snakes in their yard and, and they're there and then they, they, they're they gone because they, they burrow so fast. So I don't know if you can explain that in the little little bit of time that we have left. Yeah, uh, sometimes they will use other animal burrows too. Um, so when they dive into something, it might not even be their own. They literally just see they're being chased or they're scared and they're like, oh my gosh, an opening and they just dart into it. So sometimes it's really bad for them. Sometimes it's really good. So, um, but a lot of the times they won't use their own burrows. Um, but like a hog nose snake has that shovel nose. They actually can dig fairly quickly um, in the sandy soils. And then do you know if there's any endangered snakes in Nebraska? So officially, no. We have a um, state listed, threat. well two now, state listed threatened species, which is the Massasauga rattlesnake. And then one that was just added to the list is the timber rattlesnake, which is a state threatened species as well. Uh, federally listed, no, not in Nebraska. Okay. And then we've had questions of how fast an animal, um, like a diamondback rattlesnake might attack. Like how it's fast? Like, like it? faster than you can blink. Yeah, okay. it is super fast. Okay. That's my answer, super fast. Um, and then we, people are wanting to know how to not accidentally run over a snake when they're mowing their lawn. If you had any tips for yeah, that. Yeah, it's really hard sometimes because again, snakes are not the smartest animals out there. Um, and it's really hard just because there's so many sometimes, and especially people with like large commercial mowers, they just simply can't see them. Um, if you have like, you know, a little push mower, you can always just watch um, so that you're just watch carefully so that you don't run over them. Um, that's about all that you can do, yeah. Wow. Well, we had a lot of, of chatter today. And so um, folks are, are doing a great job um, asking their questions. Um, somebody wants to know if you're a state scientist, Monica. I am not a state scientist. Um, no, but I mean, I like science. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And and we only have two, what is a, a, a person that studies snakes called? Well, good question. Yeah, a person that studies snakes is called a herpetologist. So um, they study reptiles, amphibians, lots of different animals in that group. But yeah, Amanda, like she said, we're almost out of time. So um, I did put my email in the chat for everyone. If you guys have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Um, and then if you know someone that didn't get on today or didn't wasn't able to view it, um, this will be up probably tomorrow by tomorrow afternoon on our online game and parks page. So it's just outdoornebraska.gov slash online education. Oops, education. And then it's under the nature videos tab. Uh, so it should be up, like I said, probably tomorrow afternoon or so, um, the recording of this, and then you guys can view it later. All right. Well, good job. And thanks for asking all those great questions today. The, yeah, like great I job, said, guys. the chat was hopping. So yeah. And thanks, Amanda, for being a great co-host and a great moderator. I appreciate it. So thank you, Amanda, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and hop off, but enjoy the rest of your day and go, go be excited about snakes. Bye. Bye, guys.